Let me just have a drink of the water. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sporting Max. But today we're joined by NBL and sports broadcaster and commentator, Jack Heverin. Welcome to the podcast, Jack. Um, it's awesome to have you on. How are you? Max, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've had some fantastic names, so I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, Jack. Now, I'd like to sort of start off with um, your childhood and what was growing up. Um, and obviously, like I mentioned, your childhood like for you. Sport, sport, and more sport. I grew up in a uh, in a family. My dad was a, a, a quite a good sports person himself, but grew up in a family where the footy was on all the time mm-hmm. at home, and then it was cricket in the summer. And um, it was a footy and cricket family. I, I sort mm-hmm. of, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about basketball, but I, I sort of fell in love with basketball when I started going to primary school. But mm-hmm. yeah, it was always sport. My parents were amazing, and they supported me with playing junior footy and junior cricket and basketball mm-hmm. and my sister the same so yeah as a as a child growing up it was the best because even when we yeah. sat at the dinner table we spoke about the footy we spoke about the mm-hmm. cricket it was just a, a sporting household so who did you follow or support um in the footy growing up well I don't think my pop's going to be smart enough to be able to podcast this um it's mm-hmm. just it's, he's just a little bit too old for that <laughs> but I uh, grew up a Collingwood supporter. He He's a mad Collingwood supporter he's got the tattoo on his arm and all that sort yeah. of stuff as well from 1990 but I was five in 1990, which was the mm-hmm. year that Collingwood won the premiership. And um, I sort of started supporting them because of that. Mm-hmm. But as I grew older, I, I sort of, it's not that I didn't like Collingwood. I just mm-hmm. didn't really support them that strongly. <laughs> and I just, I love the game. So I sort of, yeah, I just support everyone, I suppose. So you mentioned sort of getting into basketball um, through your primary school years. At what age did you start to sort of really love basketball or take an interest and in, know that, um, I want to do something maybe in basketball or in sports or something like that. Yeah, I, I loved it from the moment I first saw it, Max, to be honest. Um, 1992 was my first kind of memory, which was the year mm-hmm. South East Melbourne won it. Yeah. Um, and my next door neighbours who were a couple of years older than me, they were playing basketball at primary school. It was happening every recess and lunchtime. And I started playing. Um, I didn't start playing any sort of organised basketball until grade three, but I can still remember my first game at the Frankston Basketball Stadium and mm-hmm. I, I've loved it ever since. And unfortunately, I'm too short to be any good at it at any, <laughs> sort of, at any sort of decent level. But it was just one of those things that from the moment I first watched basketball, I just mm-hmm. I fell in love with it straight away. So when did you sort of start to notice you had a passion or wanted to get into like commentating or broadcasting and things like that? Um, it was probably by accident, to be honest. I, I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I didn't grow up wanting to be a sports broadcaster. Um, I grew up wanting to be a primary school teacher, to be honest. Um, wow. And I went overseas when I was nineteen. I, I went on a bit of a bit of a cricket and a holiday trip to England for mm-hmm. for eight months. And when I got back, I had no idea what I wanted to do. My dad was in sales, so I started mm-hmm. working in sales. Um, and it was just by accident one day, Max, that uh, we used to go and watch the local footy every week. And my, mm-hmm. my dear friend was the commentator. And he said to me on the Friday night, we we're at the pub having a drink. And he said, uh, my co-commentator's pulled out. Can you please help me tomorrow? And I said, uh-huh. oh, okay. <laughs> and from that, like we talk about falling in love with basketball, 10 minutes mm-hmm. into the first quarter of calling this game on local radio, mm-hmm. it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I went, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So mm-hmm. Um, from there, uh, it was sort of all a build to, to kind of where we are now. But, yeah, I didn't grow up wanting to be a sports broadcaster. I just just love sport. Mm-hmm. So what was your first initial reaction or feeling when you're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do that and um, <laughs> go help out at the local um, station? Well, it was sort of hard because I was 21, 22, 23, so I had a full-time mm-hmm. job. So, um it's a bit different to kind of when you're at school and, and you can just go after school or on the weekends. I kind of had mm-hmm. to fit it in around a full-time job. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of it was on the weekend doing the footy. And then I started hosting the, the, the cricket show on a Saturday morning and they were great. The, the local mm-hmm. radio station on the morning to Peninsula, RPP, they just supported me and gave me so many opportunities. And they taught me how to do audio and how to do production mm-hmm. and how to panel operate and all those things that, that are all really important that you need to know. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was hard to find the time, but the more I did it, the more I just, I loved it and I wanted to learn more. So how did learning sort of audio and production and sort of that kind of producing or directing kind of thing help you get into sports or broadcasting or assist you um, with like sort of commentating? 
Well, I think now, Max, the way that the industry kind of is, and, and I say this a lot when I talk to uni students or, or media students, there's no such thing as just walking in off the street or finishing your uni degree on the Saturday and then on the Monday going and calling a game of footy for, yeah. for you know, for, or, or walking straight into the NBL commentary team or whatever it may be. Like it's a process and, and you've got to work your way in. So knowing how to produce and how to panel, that's quite often how you get your foot in the door at places. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over time you'll get your chances to show your skills and, and what you can do and improve and all that sort of stuff. So that helped me for sure. I mean, my, my first job was hosting the overnights um, mm-hmm. in 2011 on SEN, but I also did panel operating and editing and making promos and stuff like that. So it's all part of the process of learning. Mm-hmm. So now earning uh, the Melbourne Radio School's Jack Ridley, uh, Ridley Medal, what did you have to do to sort of achieve that recognition um, for hard work and determination? Oh, you've done your research, Max. Well done. <laughs> Um, that the Melbourne radio school, which unfortunately is not around anymore, but they, Mm. I owe them a lot. I I did the short course because again, I had a full-time job. So, um, the, the, one of the courses they had was six months. I I just didn't have six months. I I was in a management position in my, my full-time employment. So I did it over two weeks. I took two weeks annual leave, which I don't mm-hmm. think my work at the time knew what I was doing, but I took two, I took two weeks annual leave. I did the course. It was eight till six every day for two weeks um, and just gave it everything that I had. And I, I used to lay in bed at night thinking about radio and learning and what am I going to do mm-hmm. tomorrow? And I, I just loved it. Um, so I must have made a good impression on someone there um, because uh-huh. there's, there's, well, there's been some really good people that have won that award over the years. So mm-hmm. it's something that um, I've got in my office here and it's something mm-hmm. that I'll always cherish that they selected me above everyone else that year. Uh, you mentioned SEM before. Obviously, that links in with sort of whole crop media. Um, can you expand on what you did um, after achieving that medal and uh, starting off with crop media? Oh, I did a lot of things, a lot of things. Um, the first job I, I had there, as I mentioned, was hosting the overnights. Croc mm-hmm. Media had the the airtime with SEN. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and in that show, it's midnight till 6 a.m. You have to panel and, and host mm-hmm. and quite often produce and all those sort of things too, which was great. And then I, after that, produced a show called Sports Day, which uh, mm-hmm. back in the day was hosted by Terry Wallace and Tony Leonard. And that was a great learning experience that was a full-time producer's role and they taught mm-hmm. me so much the two of them they and they're two of my my good friends to this day and that was great and then from there an unbelievable opportunity opened up croc media had afl live which was um their fully yep. broadcast um and the executive producer position became open and that was wow. the best the best decision i ever made because i got to spend all weekend with amazing commentators and I just sat there and watched and listened and learnt and Mm -hmm. I wasn't commentating at that stage it was a full-time producing role but for two years I took notes I went home and and practiced the things that I saw that they were doing yeah Uh, and it and it helped me in a big way it helped me build my relationships with them but it helped me learn how to broadcast footy the right way when my opportunity would eventually come up Mm -hmm. so did you have to like um interview for that position Well, it was an internal position at the time. Um, There was someone doing it before me and I think they may have looked outside if they couldn't find the right person, but I just knew straight away that that was going to be a really good career move. So to be honest, sometimes you've got to see the opportunity and you've got to try and push and see if you can make something happen. And I spoke to our manager or my manager at the time and explained to her that I, it's something I would be really keen on. So they, it was really great. They gave me an opportunity and, and it was a one that I think kickstarted a lot of really good things. Um, now you mentioned before that sort of experience of sort of being on the show of sports day. Um, now sitting in the host chair of sort of multiple radio shows, I'm um, calling a wide range of variety of sports, like, you know, A-League, um, AFL, NBL, What's it like to have the versatil- um, versatility and flexibility um, of being able to call a variety um, of different sports? I think it's really important, Max. And again, this is one of those things that I would say to anyone coming through the industry is learn all the different sports. And mm-hmm. and that that's hard and that takes time. It's something that you've got to learn the not only the rules, obviously, of everything, but the sayings yeah. and, and the terminologies and then but also understand how the different sports are commentated. But it, mm-hmm. it helps you, no doubt, it helps you, you 
hopefully more attractive to, to networks mm. and to employers if you can do a range of different things. Because I think the days of just doing footy for six months and then going on holidays for six months, they're, they're yeah. done. Um, mm-hmm. The industry... The industry has really struggled during COVID, obviously, and, and there's a lot of costs that have been cut. So I think the more versatile you can be, the better you're placed for the long term. And it also helps mm. you, for example, um, if you're working for somewhere that perhaps lose the rights to a sport like yeah. footy or they lose the rights to cricket, you can still do other things for them at the time. So it was really good advice that I got early on. Uh, and it's something that, that I will always pass on to other people as well. Now, just on that sort of variety of sports, um, I know you covered and saw that you covered the 2015 uh, Cricket World Cup. Can you elaborate um, on that experience? It was awesome. It was, I yeah, I smile every time I think about it now, Max. I, I got mm-hmm. to um, my three, the sports that I love the most are, are footy, cricket and basketball. They were the mm-hmm. three I played growing up. I, I'll admit I'm a massive, massive cricket nuffy. I, I love yeah. cricket. Um, <laughs> and it was a, it's a, that's a dream to be able to follow the Australian team around for six weeks, I think it was. We called every Australian game. We went to Perth. We went to Brisbane for a washout. We went to Tasmania. We went everywhere. Um, and it ended up being that Australia made the, grand fi- the, the World Cup final at the MCG mm-hmm. in front of 90,000 people. <laughs> it was just it was an awesome experience, and, and I was really lucky um, in my time at Croc Media and SEN to get some awesome opportunities and mm-hmm. that that's one I'll never forget that was just that was so much fun now that opportunity I think did you get to talk to any players yeah we did yeah the the access that we got was was fantastic I've done a few things in cricket now and the access has been great so mm-hmm. yeah the players were accommodating and it's even really cool when you you're out on the ground you've got your, mm-hmm. your pass which means you're allowed on, onto the ground and you're having a look at the pitch and all that sort of stuff and the players are warming up next to you mm-hmm. and yeah, it's 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 an awesome experience for a cricket lover. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's amazing. Uh, now you joined EON uh, Sports Radio in 2016, hosting the uh, Brecky Show, The Morning Rush, uh, with Bianca Chatfield. What made you sort of want to join um, EON? The opportunity at the time, um, and I, I was in the executive producer's role at Croc Media mm-hmm. then, uh, and loved it, and was starting to call more games of footy as well. So those opportunities came up, but. I felt like it was time that I needed to test myself um, and also get find a, an on-air opportunity mm-hmm. for myself. Um, I'd only met Bianca once or twice before we came together um, mm-hmm. and unfortunately Eon wasn't around long enough, but I, I made a great friend in Bianca and I loved working with her every day. She's the ultimate professional and mm-hmm. it was so much fun. But, yeah, it was, it was the challenge. It was an opportunity that was presented to, you know, be – part of your own show and have it daily and, and to mm-hmm. be part of something new that Eon was building at the time. It didn't last, but um, certainly learnt a lot and made a few good friends in the process. So how do you see your experience um, at Eon, as you mentioned before, they didn't last sort of too long, unfortunately, shutting down. How do you see your sort of time there? Um, well, I think that the biggest positive is the people that I met. Uh, because some of those friendships have lasted with Bianca and with our producer at the time and and with other people involved in the business. Um, That's the best thing that you can take out of it is Mm -hmm. is the friendships that I made along the way. It was, it was tough, no doubt about it. And there were some memories Mm -hmm. that weren't great of the way that it kind of all finished, but the people that I met there and the friendships that have lasted, that's the thing that I'll certainly cherish the most. Now, covering on um, WBBL um, and JLT Cup and sort of domestic cricket, do you notice any differences um, between commentating cricket compared to, say, um, I don't know, bowls or the NBL or the AFL, apart from sort of like the terminology and the rules and things like that? Yeah, well, they're all just different. Um, so they all, they all require different skills, but they still require mm-hmm. the same amount of research and the same amount of, of knowledge that you need to build up. Um, but we were quite often lucky when we were doing the, the WBBL or the, the JLT, which is sort of the, the one day domestic competition, you used to get some really good broadcast spots. So sometimes you'd be set up sort of at ground level or, or really close to the ground. So you'd be able to, to hear everything that the players were saying yeah. and talking about. And again, I, I go back to it, Max, I love cricket. So the closer I can be to a game of cricket, the better. So mm-hmm. yeah, they, were, they, were good, they were good fun. And, and hopefully there's some more of that in the future. Um, Mark Howard's mentioned it before on the podcast. 
um, because he's been sort of like uh, gone from like sort of sitting at the game and commentating to, you know, in the studio. How do you find, um, do you find it easier to commentate, say, sitting at the game so you can just like, I don't know, use your binoculars or something to sort of see across the ground rather than having to sort of wait for the TV screens, you know, show what's going on? Yeah, I th- cricket's definitely one that I, I find mm-hmm. is a lot easier to do at the ground. Um, for mainly because you you generally got a really good commentary position that mm-hmm. you're looking uh, straight on, so you're either behind the bowler's arm mm-hmm. or you're behind the batsman, so you can see the way that the ball's swinging and what it's doing. But sometimes it can be quite hard when you're calling cricket off a studio mm-hmm. if if the ball comes off the bat. You're not sure whether it's six or whether it's gone yeah. straight up in the air. So sometimes you you can't you kind of have to just stall a little bit and just wait. Mm-hmm. So I'll always you know I understand the reasons why we have to do some things from studio these days with costs. But mm-hmm. like any commentator, if you got to choose between being at the ground or at the venue versus yeah. being in the studio, we'll choose the ground every day of the week. Mm-hmm. Now you've got your own uh, show named the Bowl Show on Sundays um, on TV. Where did your passion for bowls um, first begin? <laughs> well, this was one of those things, Max, that when you talk about versatility, um, this was something bowls mm-hmm. was was kind of given to me when I was at Croc Media as they yeah. want to start they want to start a radio show. Um, they want it to be young. The mm-hmm. average age of the Australian team is kind of mid to late twenties, and they want mm-hmm. someone around that age to host. So. I must admit at first it was the sort of thing where I kind of thought, Oh gee, what am I going to do with bowls? How am I going to, (laughs) how am I going to make this work? But again, say yes to things. And I know I've heard Howie talk about this in his own podcast, Mm -hmm. say yes to things Mm -hmm. and work it out later. So I said yes to it. Um, It took me a long time to learn the sport and learn the people within it. Mm -hmm. But that is the best part about it is the people within it. They're so lovely. And and again, I've made some great friends and I'm still involved in the sport. I did the Australian Open last week and and that was fantastic. So um, it was that was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do is learn bowls because I knew Mm -hmm. absolutely nothing about it when (laughs) I first got involved. So what's that like to then just sort of say yes, go on, oh, I'm not sure, quite sure how to sort of approach this or take this on when they're just saying, you know, you want to, do you want to take bowls? Like take, take that. Uh, a lot of research. Um, yeah. And I, I jumped on YouTube straight away and started watching bowls uh, matches and trying mm. to work it out. I was also really lucky. My, my pop, um, who's one of my favorite people in the, on the planet is was a bowler himself. Um, so I rung pop straight away. And after he obviously got very excited about it, mm. I said to him, mate, I need you to help me understand <laughs> the sport. So he was really good. But when you, when you get thrown something like that, um, the worst thing I think you can ever do is just turn up on the day and say, okay, yeah. what are we doing? So yeah. even the very first radio show that I did, I'd done weeks of reading and watching and trying to understand as best as I could. I never pretended to be an expert. And to this mm-hmm. day, I, I still don't pretend to be an expert, but at least I, I turned up with some sort of knowledge that it kind of sounded like I knew what I was talking mm-hmm. about. So how did you get your show um on Triple One Six SEN, the sport and capital, um, to sort of come about. Um, so there was a change uh, in management around 2018. SEN mm-hmm. were, were purchased, and, and SEN and Croc Media became one. And mm-hmm. and that role was offered to me at the time. Um, there'd been uh, a host of that show, Mark Fine, who'd been in there for ten years. Management decided that they wanted to go in a different direction, mm-hmm. um, and offered me the role. It was it was tough at the start because um, Fine he had such a loyal audience, and, and understandably yeah. so, he was fantastic in that slot. So, um, but it was the sort of thing for me, career wise, that I had to say yes to because mm-hmm. to have your own show, to have it on Metropolitan it's Radio, mm-hmm. yeah, it, absolutely, it is, mate. And and it wasn't just the show that came with it. It was the opportunity to do mm-hmm. Big Bash and Test Cricket uh, and to do basketball on radio, which I'd never commentated basketball yeah. at any level before. <laughs> so there was all these different things that came with it. Um, it was right place, right time. We spoke about Eon before. I'd kind of, mm-hmm. I'd been freelancing for 18 months and doing bits and pieces and trying to make ends meet. This was an opportunity that was just too good to say no to. So, and it was one that I loved. I, I really enjoyed the, the three years in the role. Um, now, I think it was in late 2019 um, where you became a play-by-play commentator for the NBL. Where did that and sort of how did that opportunity uh, present itself? Um, I'd been doing some – so I'd been calling all the, the Melbourne United games for radio mm-hmm. on SEN 
Um, and that was, that was awesome. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, I kind of knew a couple of people in at the NBL who were, have been great helps to me along the way. I, mm-hmm. I just reached out and said, look, if you're ever in need of anyone, and they actually weren't at the time. And this is sort of, mm-hmm. this is a good lesson for, for youngsters along the way. I reached out and sort of said, look, I'm here, I'm available if you need yeah. me. And they said, oh, no, we're actually fine, but thanks for letting us know. Mm-hmm. Um, the following year, kind of reached out and got a few games here or there. Mm-hmm. So, and, and again, it was one of those things that when the chance comes and when they call your name, don't you mess it, it up. Yeah. Don't, yeah, absolutely. You take it and don't mess it up. Do the best you can. Um, now, you're also a WNBL commentator. How do you find, uh, I guess, being on TV and calling, you know, what's happening right in front of you? I, I love it. I don't necessarily need to see my, myself on camera. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not that fussed by that at all. Yeah. But I, I do love that there is something really cool about you're doing professional sport and mm-hmm. people are watching it. And I kind of sometimes like to think that maybe they've had a crappy day at work or mm-hmm. maybe they, they just want to come home and relax and, and sport can be their relax. And mm-hmm. we play a really, really small part maybe sometimes in, in helping people have a better day or, or watch what they love and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, the, the WNBL I did last season and mm-hmm. um, I'd watched the WNBL for a very long time. I respect it. I think it's one of the mm-hmm. best women's leagues in the world. So um, to get the opportunity to be involved in that and to to do a lot of games um, was 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 a whole lot of fun. And, and it's a great league. And, you know, especially mm-hmm. last season with COVID, there were so many good players, good Australian players that came back to the league that I yeah. think made the league even stronger. Now, you mentioned before that sort of how you got into the NBL, you know, just doing a couple of games here and there. Then this season, you sort of go on from there and then you do it almost like every night. <laughs> so what's that been like for you this year, um, doing the amount of games which you have? I think I've seen you almost every night on the – and he heard you. I love listening to it um, every night on the NBL. It's strange, isn't it? It kind of went from doing mm-hmm. one game every two or three weeks to doing mm-hmm. like five games a week. Um, yeah. Yeah, this season was nuts, wasn't it? I think we'll mm-hmm. always remember this NBL 21 season as the one that we we got away with mm-hmm. COVID and we didn't stop at all, which was awesome. But there were a lot of games, yeah. But it was – you kind of just got into a flow. I actually mm-hmm. think it was easier for me this year doing lots of games yeah. rather than doing a game every couple of weeks because and you kind of have to – you've got to find your groove again. Yeah, you got to go back to mm-hmm. the start. Whereas I knew every player, I knew – what shoes they were wearing and, mm-hmm. and <laughs> who strapped their knees and who strapped mm-hmm. their ankles and, and their shoulders and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. And it came along at a time where some things had changed for me and it opened up the opportunity to do more games and I really appreciate it. Yeah. And to, to have the chance this year to do all yeah. the finals um, was, was something I'll never forget. Um, now I've got to ask you hosted the gazes, the NBL 21 last <laughs> night, Russ Cotton obviously taking out MVP honours. Can you take me through the day and when it was recorded and what the set was like? So we went live. Um, Mm -hmm. A a couple of people have asked me that and said, oh, what time did did you record that a few days Mm -hmm. before? And I said, no, no, that was all live. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was was really, really professionally well done. The team Mm -hmm. at the NBL, Tony Skinner, who's head of broadcast, is is an absolute genius when it comes to these sorts of Mm -hmm. things. He's just the sort of person that leaves no stone unturned. He makes sure that every Mm -hmm. single minor detail is taken care of. But... Yeah, we got there about four o'clock, I think, mm-hmm. and started to go through our rehearsals and started to go through the different things we're doing. But there was all the, the lead up work as well. Yep. And Max, one of the hardest things was that I found out the awards. So the awards night was on the Wednesday. Yep. I found out the awards on the Saturday. Oh, no, got to so, keep your mouth shut. So I knew who won <laughs> everything, but even I even had to sort of agree under integrity that I couldn't speak to anyone so yeah even the guys from the commentary team were sort of saying oh who, who do you think mm-hmm. won this and i had to say nothing and i very nearly i can say <laughs> it now, I, can, I can say it now i did a melbourne united game mm-hmm. before the wednesday and i knew that joe lawala chul had won best six man of the year mm-hmm. and it came this close to falling out of my mouth at the very <laughs> last <laughs> at the very last second i stopped yeah. myself and i nearly told everyone who won it uh-huh um, so how was the night for you, like from your perspective? I really enjoyed it. And I think to be, to be asked to do that uh, mm-hmm. was a huge show of faith from the league um, because there's so many brilliant hosts mm-hmm. around and there's so many brilliant hosts within the, the commentary team. So 
I certainly didn't expect to be asked. I, mm-hmm. I didn't ask them if they needed anyone to do it. I thought I'd just be sitting at home like everyone else watching it. But uh-huh. um, yeah, it was it, it's it was more it was more I guess thankful that they trusted me. It's their biggest night, and they trusted mm-hmm. me to host it. So that's that's something that meant a lot to me. Now you also commentated on Game Three of the NBL Grand Final Series, where Melbourne got that sweep on Perth to claim <laughs> NBL Twenty One Champions. You and I, Baba, finishing the game off um, with a, a dunk that I love from standing up in the stands. Um, how did you feel when commentating? What I think most people thought, and was of course the last game of the season. Were you in the stands, were you, Max? Were you there? I was. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> did you go nuts? <laughs> Oh, I was going crazy. I love to see um, United. I go for United. So love to see them get the championship. A couple of guys on the podcast get presented with their rings. Yeah, it was it was a good win. They were the best team all season. Um, and they they built – I know that some people will say that you know, they, they spent more money than most teams and all that sort of stuff. I still think it's one thing – to get the players in, it's another to mm-hmm. still win the championship. It's, and it's not an easy thing to do to manage the the egos and court time and all that sort of stuff. You look mm-hmm. at a guy like Scotty Hobson, New Zealand yeah. last year, all NBL second team was one of the best players in the competition. Mm-hmm. He comes to Melbourne and he ends up coming off the bench. Oh, like yeah. that, that's sacrifice. That's players yeah. <laughs> who, who understand what they need to do to win a title. So, yeah, I, I, I thought the result, we'll never know. Like if mm-hmm. Bryce had have played for Perth and had Mitch mm-hmm. Norton have not got injured and Clint Stein and Luke Travers, who knows what could have happened. But mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of what ifs in life. And at the end of the day, Melbourne stayed fit. They stayed healthy and they were on top for all but four rounds of the season. So mm-hmm. logic tells you that they probably deserve to win it. Um, moving into next year, obviously, Joe, big Joe the Wall, took sixth man of the year, like we mentioned, inking a new deal with Melbourne United to stay there for another few years. Um, and then Jack McVeigh signing with the Jack Jumpers. Who do you see, and Rich McCarran, that's the big one, going to the 36ers. Yeah. Who do you see as the other sort of free agents in the league who um, might be going to the Jack Jumpers or somewhere like um, the 36ers or something like that? Well, the next couple of days will be really interesting. So free agency Mm opened Monday. Mitch McCarron's a huge move from the Adelaide 36ers. And their general manager, Jeff Van Groningen, said that they wanted to be the biggest player in the free agency Mm -hmm. period. Well, there's no bigger way to make a splash than getting Mitch McCarron. (laughs) So that that Adelaide team of Daniel Johnson, Sunday Detch in the backcourt with Mitch McCarron, if they can keep Isaac Humphreys, that's four of their five starters Uh that are all Australian. And, And... it's going to be a really tough defensive unit. So, yeah, with the Jack, with the Jack Jumpers, I mean, Isaac yeah. Humphreys hasn't signed yet. Whether you could get him in as the middleman yeah. and build, build a team around him, um, I think like everyone, I think we all thought that Nick Kay was going there mm-hmm. with, Mitch, with Mitch Norton as a package deal. Now, Nick's not going there. We haven't mm-hmm. heard about Mitch, but um, everything I'm hearing is that Mitch is probably more likely to stay in Perth. In so Perth, that, yeah. that, They'll have something planned, Tasmania. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about that. They won't go into this first season with an average roster. Um, there might be a shock coming. I wish I knew who it was, but mm-hmm. there might be a, a shock coming in the next few days. Um, now, sports MC, how do you find sort of hosting events in that entire experience? Uh, it wasn't something that was natural to me at first, to be honest, Max. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you stand up on a stage in front of a room and everyone goes quiet all of a sudden and they all look mm-hmm. at you and you think, Oh, oh okay. Oh, I better, I better get this right. <laughs> um, and especially when you do things, you know, functions like a, a, a pregame function at the footy or a big awards night, people also want to go there and, and have a drink and have a chat mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. So it can be hard sometimes when you're trying to talk over the top of people, but mm-hmm. it, it was honestly functions and MC. It just, it's, it's taken a lot of practice and, mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll happily admit that there's a few functions that I did in the earlier days that I've never been asked back by people. Uh-huh. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I probably sucked at the first few functions I did. <laughs> so that's okay. And I'm probably still very much a work in progress with it. But yeah, I'll, functions, I'll admit, was something that at first um, didn't come that natural to me. So that's taken a bit of time and a bit of practice. And like a lot of other things, watching how other people do it and, and mm-hmm. see how you can get better. Um, now, obviously, sort of, if we go back to the NBL, Josh Giddy, what a star he was this season. Mitch McCarran sort of half 
or almost fulfilling that void left by Josh there at the 36ers at the point guard role. But Josh been predicted, I think I saw today in the recent, most recent mock draft, um, as the 10th pick going to the Pelicans mm. um, in the draft. Where do you think he's going to end up at what pick in the draft? I, I'd love to think that he would go 10. Um, mm. I, I think there's so much prestige about being a, a top 10 pick. It mm. doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a successful career mm. and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you, you'll be in the league for a very long time. Where there's mm-hmm. there's en- endless amounts of first round picks in the NBA who have never made it, but mm-hmm. um, it gives you a better chance for Josh. It'll it'll probably mean a bit more money, which is always yeah. nice too. But um, I think he he's a very unique player. He's he's got mm-hmm. so much so many smarts and so much court awareness that yes, I think he would admit that his jump shot needs to get better. And I know he's been working a lot with with Andrew mm-hmm. Gaze on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he gets into the NBA system, they'll help him out as well. But mm-hmm. his knowledge of the game and his awareness of where he is at all times at 18 years of age is, is mm-hmm. remarkable. So I'd love to see him go top 10. I think the way it's going, it does look like he's going to be somewhere around that sort of 10 to 15 yep. mark. Um. So what about Mojave King? Obviously, he didn't declare for the draft. Do you think he's going to go one more year in the NBL and then head off to the NBA? I'd like to see... Yeah, I'd like to see Mahava. I'd actually, I'd like to see Justin and Jessup have another year as well in yeah. the NBL. Um, I, we saw flashes from Justin, mm-hmm. but he's come out of the college system. It's his first year playing professionally, yeah. and I think he probably would admit that he he learned a few things along the way. And I think mm-hmm. Mahave will be the same. Cairns have, have announced Adam Ford as their coach this week, mm-hmm. which I, I think is a fantastic pickup for them. I don't know whether Mahave is going to mm-hmm. go back to Cairns or he might consider his options, but. I would say that he needs another league, another year, sorry, playing mm-hmm. professionally and in this league, hopefully as well. But yeah, I think some of the things we saw from him in the back end of the season, we know the kid can play. We know he yeah. can definitely <laughs> play. We just want to see a bit more of him, I suppose. Um, have you got any advice um, for me to get to the next level and sort of get into sports broadcasting and commentating and radio? Well, I will say one thing, Max. You are a mile ahead of most people <laughs> your age and, and similar who are trying to build a career because you, your podcast is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And as I said off, off the top, you're getting some amazing guests. But that the best advice I ever got um, mm-hmm. was what we spoke about earlier with being versatile. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have to be an expert on any sport, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I don't. I certainly don't think I'm an expert on any sport, but yep. learning learning different sports, learning the rules, the the, the lingo, the mm-hmm. the way that they work, and all that sort of stuff. Because eventually, when your opportunity comes up, mm-hmm. um, it, it it's not going to be what you want it to be straight away. As, as we spoke about, you're not yeah. going to just jump straight into calling it footy at the MCG or calling yeah. <laughs> a, te- a, a test match. Your first job might be getting the coffees for the people at the MCG. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it's, it's being versatile, learning Mm -hmm. different things. And when that chance comes up, say, yes, say, Mm -hmm. yes, take it on. You might be scared. You might be a little bit worried and all that (laughs) sort of stuff, but take it on mate, because, um, it's a great industry. It's tough and Mm -hmm. there, you can have some setbacks along the way, but, um, to be able to, we're very lucky to be able to, to call this our full-time job. There's a lot of people who would love to be in our position Mm -hmm. and, and we should never forget that. Thanks, Jack, for coming on the podcast today and setting aside half an hour or so of your time to come and have a chat. Um, It's been an honour. My pleasure, Max. Thank you for having me. You're a star. Thanks, Jack. Stay tuned, everyone, for some more Sporting Max. Now throw it over to uh, the voice of Melbourne, Rattler.